All right, I think we're live. <laughs> so, hi everybody from uh, uh, this is the the Red Reviews normal live mm -hmm. stream time. This is uh, we're doing something a little different tonight. Uh, we got a nice big panel. We're going to talk about the U.S. election from oh boy. I assume a variety of perspectives. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, first off, I guess I want to thank uh, Summer Random Geek. Uh, for setting all this up and getting everybody together. Yes, you can blame me. <laughs> doing doing the messaging and whatnot. Yes. And uh, yeah, so uh, I guess I'll even let you kick it off here. It was sure. your idea. What yeah. do you What do you want to talk about? <laughs> uh, so yes, uh, hello. Uh, I am I'm Summer Nikki, currently cosplaying as a Scottish wizard, um, <laughs> and I. I don't know. It's kind of like I was on Ellen McDonald's like a uh, YouTube channel not so long ago, like uh, last month and like uh, last Saturday to talk about like and uh, hello Jamie J in the YouTube chat uh, about the upcoming election. And I kind of like, thought, you know, it's been like two years since Gore Johnson had like a panel on like a uh, very different topics. The last one he did was like left this unity, which was I was a part of and Justin Clark was a part of. So I thought, oh, this would be a good idea for Corey Johnson to have another panel stream as well, too. And I kind of thought about the people that I wanted to talk to, so too, including Steve Chives, uh, Chrissy Osterdy, and like uh, Foxy Jezebel as well, too. So that's why I wanted to like do that sort of thing. So it's like, yeah, let's go in the room to introduce yourselves. Well, oh, yes, I'm Summer Geek. I'm an Oracle <laughs> Cynicalist. And what do I think, uh, what and what do we feel, just a general vibe, what do we feel about the upcoming election? Uh, I want this thing to be over. I think I will like leave it there at my general five and then like let's go around the room. Let's start with Steve. I, you know, we, we don't agree on a lot of, we, we disagree on a lot politically, but I mean, we're on the same side, but we just, we right. argue about stuff. But like, I agree with you. I'm ready for it to be over. <laughs> like I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm like cautiously optimistic about yeah. the result. I'm, I'm not completely hopeless i'm you know uh, but yeah i'm i'm ready for it to be over <laughs> you know and it sucks because like i feel that way before every election yeah i kind of like i kind of envy the people who have either found a way to choose to not care or you know their lives are just like they just have other shit going on mm -hmm. and they can't afford to worry about the election too much um it always just it's it's front of mind until it's over and you know hopefully it's a good result but even if it's a bad result there's always a part of me that's like all right well <laughs> at least it's over you know i forgot that i need my microphone <laughs> <laughs> professional streamer moment uh i'll go to chris i next and then like a uh, fox suggest afterwards so chrissy go next um yeah i'm chrissy i am um just somebody who occasionally shares opinions, mostly on Twitter um, at this point, though I used to do various other things. Um, gee, I don't have, um, as far as my feelings about the election, I mean, I guess it would be just as well for it to be over. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I have... Uh, it's been many years since I've felt like, oh boy, the election's coming up. So <laughs> <laughs> I was a child. <laughs> was a child. Uh, but it will happen and somebody will be uh, elected. And I mean, yeah, I, it's more than I, there are people, well, let's just say that whoever Netanyahu wants is mm -hmm. like, oh, <laughs> yeah. I am against that person. Mm -hmm. uh, coming into power, and um, so there's a worst possible outcome. Yeah, and yeah. and I'm a cynical, cynical person. What can I do? Oh yeah, same same here. <laughs> <laughs> so Foxy, so your views on things. Uh, the, first of all, introduce yourself, and like also, what's the general vibes on like the election you have? So I'm Foxy Jazabel. I describe myself as a these days, I am more of a failed content creator. I gave mm. it a try for a time. I failed at it. It's fine. 
I'm a home care worker now. Mm. Something I happen to be good at and, you know, don't mind doing for mm. 12 hours a day. But um, I used to, well, my channel is still up, but I used to post videos more regularly, you know, just, you know, just a loud mouth on the internet. <laughs> who has opinions about a lot of things, atheism, feminism, pop culture, politics, nerd things, all, all that fun stuff. These days, um, I stick to Twitter and I kind of have branched out on threads a little bit. So, but as far as this election goes, um, and I apologize because apparently there's a plane passing over. Sorry. <laughs> It's always nosy in, in the hood. So just get used to that uh, whenever, if ever we ever talk again. But as far as the election goes, I can't wait for it to be over with, uh, with, the, with the asterisk. Mm -hmm. I think we have an opportunity to, to, there is an opportunity to press forward for some much needed change and it's really up to, it's really going to be up to us whether we want to take the chance mm -hmm. or if we're just going to go with business as usual. I live in New York. I'm a born and raised New Yorker and I'm in New York. So um, mm -hmm. my vote doesn't really matter. It's probably blasphemous to say that, but it doesn't because it usually goes blue regardless. But in a way it leaves me free to vote on you know, to stand on business and vote on principle. I voted out of fear once for Biden because I was I was fearful mm -hmm. that people were not that people were that ignorant that they would continue to vote against their best interest. So as a New Yorker, I voted for Biden begrudgingly. And after seeing what has transpired for the past two years, I I said to myself that I would not make that mistake again. So mm -hmm. now I'm free to um, stand on business as re um, regarding how my vote is concerned. So I will either be going for the PSO candidates or for the Green Party, because now now I, at first I wasn't torn between anyone. I was just going to go cruising, cruising Garcia 2024. That's what I was going to do. But, you know, now the Green Party has been kind of uh, ramping up. So now I'm a little mm -hmm. torn. So we'll see what happens. We'll, we'll, we'll see. Maybe I'll flip a coin mm. on election day. And But yeah, that's me. Sorry for that. Sorry. No problem. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> that's it. Uh, Might as well go with Justin. He's the other American. True. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so hi. Yeah, I'm Justin Clark. I'm a public historian in my day job. And for fun and for my, I guess, my own being a glutton for punishment. Um, I've been working on the show Red Reviews with Corey for the last three years, going on four, which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, it's been the best project I've worked on, so I, I genuinely love doing it. I really, really love doing it. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of this election, um, I totally get how people feel in, in the sense that uh, this election is strange in many ways, because normally... The presidential elections pretty much start right after the midterms, which is yeah. what they did, right? You know, in 2022, they pretty much started, right? Mm -hmm. And the Joe Biden of 2022 is very different than the Joe Biden of 2024 in the sense that not just politically, but also just like um, physically, you know, I think he was much better, at, more capable of handling the sort of political aspects of the job. I can't speak to like the you know, the, the just being an executive and doing the day-to-day -day work. But in terms of the political part of it, I think that um, certainly in that first debate, I think people knew. I mean, I, you know, but I was originally kind of the person that was like, ah, man, I don't know. I know history too well. Like when Democrats have problems like this, it, it tends not to work for them. So the one thing I will say is that it has been, I think, in kind of incredible to watch the Democrats kind of get their stuff together in a very short amount of time. Hmm. That kind of blew my mind that they all kind of were like, yep, it's going to be Kamala. And there was really no argument about that. Hmm. And, yeah. then, and then it was like, and then the convention happened and that all went really smooth. And I was just kind of impressed. I was like, normally the Democratic Party don't have their, their stuff together quite like this. Usually it's a mess. So I was kind of impressed by that. Um, so I think if Kamala Harris wins in November, uh, 
I think it will be, I think, kind of nothing short of a miracle. Because I think if you had asked me, you know, a year ago, who was going to be president in 2025, I would easily have told you Donald Trump. I, I, I genuinely mm-hmm. believe Donald Trump would have absolutely crushed it against Biden. I, I think that there's just too much going on that would not, that people would just not be willing to vote for him again. Um, whether it's the whether it's the continuing genocide in Gaza, which the yeah. lot of people, not to mention the fact, just like the sort of the bread and butter issues of like you know inflation, cost of living, all of that, right? And wrongly or rightly, and I think it's mostly wrongly, people for some reason often think the Republicans are better on the economy. It's very weird. I don't understand that. It makes no yeah. sense. Yeah. But they do. Um, and Trump polls better on that and has consistently. So, which is, again, very, very strange because his economic policy is completely incoherent. Like he wants yeah. to get rid of the, he like wants to ban, you know, tips for waitresses or waiters. Mm-hmm. That, and, but then also wants to do a ton of tariffs. Like it's kind of all over the place. Although a Republican being for the protective tariff is very on brand. I mean, that's very William <laughs> McKinley, 1896. So the yeah. Republicans have been the party of the protective tariff for a long time, but I think in general, the way that I feel is I do look forward to it being over. Um, I just, my thing is, is that I just hope Trump stays out of the White House. Like, am I like the yeah. most jazzed person of, about Kamala Harris? No. No. But the fact that she's kind of, in many ways, done better than I thought she would kind of blows my mind because I thought it was just going to be like a mess and it wasn't. And I, and it's not been so far. And that, that has, I think, surprised me. Um, but yeah, I just, I think that, the the dangers to American society by a second Trump term are just too much. And that's not to discount the problems with Harris. There are deep yeah. ones, right? You know, she comes with a lot of the baggage that Biden has, right? Being the current yeah. vice president. But like, there are a lot of really interesting things going on that we lose if Trump gets a second term. One are these antitrust cases against big tech and, and mm. the head of the FTC, Lena Khan, right? So the, the big antitrust cases that are going on right now against Google, those will be done, right? And, and history is precedent on that. When Microsoft was like the last big company to face antitrust, once the Bush administration came in, they killed that antitrust case. It was a slap on the wrist. They made Microsoft pay a fine and do a couple of different things, but they didn't break Microsoft up. And that's exactly what Trump would do if he got into office. Like it would, they would kill an antitrust lawsuit. And, and I think breaking up big tech is a very good thing thing for the country and just mm-hmm. you know just for the society in general um biden did better appointments to the national labor relations board we've seen waves of unionization that have happened over the last couple of years largely as a result of that um the fact that he surprisingly did okay with the longshoreman strike that recently happened or the the dock worker strike rather oh yeah um, I heard about that that yeah. he didn't invoke taft hartley that he backed them which surprises me um, and that they ended up getting, I think, a 65% raise over seven years, which is, I, I okay. think, an in- incredibly um, successful gain for them. So I think there are things in a Kamala Harris presidency that could be certainly better than a Trump presidency, but I acknowledge all the limits to it, right? I mean, this is, you know, she came, when she gave her acceptance speech to the DNC, she said, oh, you know, America ha- will have the most lethal military in the world. <laughs> Pretty weird thing. <laughs> An extremely weird thing for a Democrat to say, right? Like that sounded very George W. Bush, two thousand. Yeah, it's very it's weird, not, right? And 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 it's you been, know, the, the instinct to oh, we're gonna show we're gonna show the world that we're more neocon than the neocons. And it's like when the sorry, I'm I'm trying not to cuss. <laughs> like when is Feel free. Like, Feel like, free. Like, <laughs> like when the fuck has that ever worked? Like never. I know. Never in the history of never done. Like, and this is where their instincts, I think, were bad. Like when, when, like her saying, like, there's going to be a Republican in my cabinet. It's like, stop doing this, like, <sighs> yeah, faux bipartisanship like, comedy stuff. Like, not comedy as in like ha ha comedy, but comedy, like getting along, right? Like, let's bit beyond that because Republicans don't care about any of that. Yeah, they and they never did, and and they never have, and, no. and they and they won't, and they never will. So it's like, why are you pretending? Because they're one. That's, Especially, yeah. especially when we know that you know when it comes down to things that you do supposedly care about, mm-hmm. they 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 will act like they know how to exercise power the same way that their opponents do. do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But when it comes to you know maintaining the hegemonic world order, you know, then, then then we then we can you know when it comes to like oh we have to put a ban on TikTok, then we get to see like oh so oh so you guys can when it's when it's something you care about you 
your common sense, your common sense comes back. But when it comes to everything else, it's like, yeah, it's very interesting to watch the Democrats become like the the pro war, pro um, mm -hmm. like pro censorship like people. That's that's mm -hmm. been very weird considering that like. 20 years ago, again, I'm thinking of when I came to political consciousness during the Bush administration, mm -hmm. the, the like Democrats were the ones, you know, a lot of them mainstream wise, at the very least, were fighting against the war in Iraq, wanted yeah. to end the war in Iraq. They, they you know, they wanted to um, hold the Bush administration accountable for the warrantless wiretap program and the torture program. Right. Yeah. So it's very weird to watch that happen. But a part of that is just I think. That's the trouble of living in America, where the, p the political center has moved so far to the right that people yeah. who would have been neocons 20 years ago are now Democrats. Right. Um, and I think well, that's the, I think that's a real challenge. The Democrats also have. And I say this as a registered Democrat. The Democrats also have always had it's a cold that the party can never get over. They they have always been at least in, in terms of the, the party establishment, the mainstream of the party. Yeah. They've always been insecure about the soft on crime thing. They've always yeah. been insecure about the, you know, you don't like the military enough thing, mm -hmm. you know, and instead of making a case for being something else and that thing being valid and maybe even better than what the Republicans are selling, they have to do this thing where, oh, no, we hey, we can bomb stuff, too. Hey, wait a minute. No, what the Republicans are saying, no, we can. We can, Hey, we'll fight wars just as well as they will. And, you know, we'll fund the police just as much as they will and, yeah, well, yeah, we'll you know listen, instead of well, yeah we'll listen to racist principles just as good as the republicans do yeah <laughs> or, and, be, or be tougher uh, on the border yeah and yeah the, oh yeah we'll the border thing the border. The, yeah. there are the border thing uh like that's for me personally that's my biggest problem with the biden harris administration because i feel like that's I mean, I, there there are political realities at play, like, you know, uh, th there are certain things that Congress would have to do. And with a Republican, I, either a Republican majority or a or a, a you know, a, a Republican um, constituency in the Senate mm -hmm. that's large enough that they could, you know, block whatever they wanted to do. Like there is a limit to what Biden could do in terms of like a major shift in border policy. But even considering that. Um, I'm really disappointed in in the border, you know, in the immigration policy of the Biden administration and what it seems like it will be carried through to a Harris administration. Um, but, yeah, the whole like I want to put a Republican in my cabinet. That's again, that's like a Democrat party thing. It's like the nostalgia for bipartisanship, you know, like, oh, never, Tip O'Neill and Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan yeah. used to have lunch. Like, OK. <laughs> Yeah, it's like we accuse, we, you know, a lot of times we rightly accuse conservatives of sort of wishing for some some form of history that never that's never really happened. And then it's the same for the Democrats. It's almost like they it's almost like they think that politics at some point was exactly how they've seen it in the West Wing and they want to no. want to go back yeah. to that. And it's like yeah. it's never been like that. Like, the, like, what do you mean? And the fact that, what, like, that yeah. I think the fact that like a lot of the staffers for the Barack Obama administration were basically huge fans of the West Wing has like yeah. permeated yeah. the, the like people the class and the, the uh, consulting class in the Democrats. I don't need to remember that the West Wing was a fictional TV show. It was. A, right. it was I like the West Wing. I thought the West <laughs> Wing was a great show, but I never was like, oh, boy, isn't it great that this is how it literally is in Washington? No. What? It's <laughs> this like this is what I often <laughs> tell people like like. The West Wing is Atlas Shrugged for liberals. So what I mean by that. <laughs> That's what a great way to put it. Is that. What a great way to put it. So like libertarians. First so libertarians <laughs> believe that, you know, Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged is real. They'll often say, well, I'm like Dagny Taggart or I'm like Howard Rourke or whatever. Or I'm angry. Are. And he, and liberals do that with the West Wing too. Not all of them, but some people are like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a lot like Josh. Or I'm a lot like CJ Craig. And it's like, this is a show. I want you to understand yeah. this is a TV yeah. show. This is not these real. Fiction, these are fictional characters. <laughs> yeah. fictional characters. Yeah. <laughs> and you want, and it's like, that's the part that I think is very frustrating because I always make the joke of like, I think there's some people who still genuinely believe that you can get a bunch of right wing psychos in a room. And if you just show them your 42, your 42 slide PowerPoint presentation with all yeah. your facts and figures, yeah. that somehow that they will, they will go, oh my God, you're, you're, <laughs> Trump to yeah. anything I've said, and I agree with you now, because that's not how politics works.
Mm-hmm. You know, Adam Johnson of Citatious Needed always says politics is fundamentally an evangelical enterprise. And it is. Yeah. It's, it's an emotional one in which you're trying sure. to get people to 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 come to your side that you can come to them with facts and figures. But at the end of the day, people are moved by their feelings. Sure. Yeah. And and yeah. so with with um, I think with a, with a lot of the the issues at play here, whether it's you know, whether it's foreign policy or the border or the economy. There's like people, there's like vibes and then there's facts, right? And, mm-hmm. and and I think with a lot of this, there's just this, this is like the vibes election. I think that's the good sure. way to describe right. it. You know, like the, the oh, Harris campaign. Vibe, yeah, vibes and joy. And, and vibes and joy and like all of this kind of stuff. And it's like, and it's I like, mean, good. to be fair, it did work in 2008 with like hope and change. Right. I mean, exactly. And that's yeah, what they're yeah. trying to recreate, right? And I mean, the question is, because people often think that they can just sort of easily recreate what Obama did and you can't like the yeah, failures right. of people like like you know like um Helene Castro and Pete Buttigieg and others who've tried to do the Barack Obama thing and it didn't quite work for them just goes to show you like kind of how a singular talent that Obama was and so like if, yeah. if if um if Kamala Harris can kind of recreate some of that I think she might win but this is going to be a very tight election um, I, I think it's going to be very similar to 2020 where we may not know for a few days who won the election. Um, oh, absolutely. And, and so, you know, I think it's it's I'm like like Steve, I think I'm cautiously optimistic that that Trump won't win. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, just as a little like a story and note, like the one of the very, very silly reasons I don't want Trump to win again is that that will mean that Grover Cleveland is no longer the only president <laughs> who have served two non consecutive terms. And Grover Cleveland deserves better than to be forever paired off with that. Donald Trump Donald in Trump. American history. Yes. Yep. But that's, you know, not that Grover Cleveland was a particularly good guy either, but I'm just saying like, oh, all presidents yeah. are bastards. If you but, but, it's, the, it's, uh, but that's yeah. always like the thing of like, man, he'd lose that, which would be, yeah, poor guy. That's his only thing. His only that's thing. the only thing yeah. that people remember him people for. Remember now him. Yep. Th- that and they confuse him with the baseball player. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And so, Wait, like, which I, one was I, the president? I, which one was the pitcher? <laughs> and like, I can understand folks' concerns are, you know, are warranted in regards to Trump. But like just seeing how like like how he's been going around campaigning, like his campaign like these days is like it's totally not the same as as his first as his first time around yeah. like mm-hmm. it's really bad and just the fact that it's like really really bad now but mm-hmm. folks are still worried that he still might get in i think that's i think that kind of it really says a lot about about the people no more, i think that's I think for that's, sure i think that says more about more about popu- more about populations yes more than the than the folks who folks who come up because he, his his stuff has just been obviously bad and for someone like me who has i i i guess i've gotten a bit more cynical the further the further along my um my path in politics goes, you know, I guess the more, the more radicalized I become, the more cynical mm. I become when I look at here. when it comes to electoral politics and just seeing, you know, the pomp and circumstance, there's hardly any pop and very little circumstance. And I'm like, it, you know, and I'm like, you guys are like, folks are really concerned about this. You know, meanwhile, like, just thinking about his time versus president versus, you know, what we've had to undergo with the current administration. Hmm. Sorry, excuse me. Like, it's, it's almost like, oh, they have my show. Oh, they, oh, someone wanted Foxy to talk live on, talk live on the show. <laughs> Let's just send all our flights over the Bronx, like, right now. Not now, but right now. Anyway, you know, I... I can understand the nuances and the slight differences in, in in the differences between you know his administration versus the current administration versus what a second administration under Trump could be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but as someone at the bottom, you know, I have proletariat auntie there for a reason. Like, mm-hmm. no one is really appealing to me, so my circumstances. Yeah. 
personally, my my circumstances have not changed. If anything, they've gotten worse. And you know, being someone who's been in a blue in a blue city and state for the longest, and given you know the recent stuff that's been going on with my cities, of- oh yes, <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yeah. that yeah. headed bitch Eric Adams. <laughs> <laughs> hey, he's the pilot. Hey, how, why do you want the plane to crash? He's the pilot of the plane. He's flying the plane, and you want the plane to crash, Foxy. <laughs> they are, they are coming at me because, I, because of everything I've been saying about the border. They're trying to attack me. Get the fuck out of here, Paul Henderson. You just, just, the, just the black Giuliani. Like a like like a true mob boss, you know. Oh, yes. yeah. going yeah. you know, going off to Turkey like every other day. Yeah, and like shit. flagrantly corrupt. Like, how did yeah. you think you weren't gonna get caught, man? And the staffers are just texting each other. Wait a minute, should I not like actually mention that this one of the text? Is this illegal what we're doing? You know? Make sure to delete the text you sent to me. Yeah, <laughs> that's my favorite. And I think it did. Understanding similar... that, like, even if you delete the text, like. The like, 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 you know, the internet remembers no matter how good you are, uh, unless you're like maybe CIA, NSA, good at scrubbing away your history or whatever, yeah. most people aren't. So it's like, mm-hmm. that's every, true. Uh, communication companies they they all remember, yeah. they remembers no matter how I, good you think you are, you are not. So but all of that to say, it's hard for me to, it's hard for me to to give folks, you know, especially like you know the you know the political class, you know, the petite bourgeois political class who are yeah. just up in arms of, about you know, who it was a, amazing seeing how fast they came to they came around Kamala when it became evident that. They were going to put their, that she was going to be pushed to be the one. Mm-hmm. And seeing how everything just coalesced around her so quickly, how much money they raised within the first couple of days of the news coming out and everything, mm-hmm. and how every election cycle, when when you know the working class, when we make our when we try to make our concerns known, it's always like, oh, you know, we can always we can try to push them from the left, you know. But right now it's about stopping, it's about making sure that, you know, that Armageddon doesn't come. But it's been like that for like the past two, three, or four cycles. <laughs> so after a while, it's like, it's like, well, bitch, how many more times do we have to do we have to rally to stop, you know, to 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 from being annihilated? You know, what does it say about the party that we have to rally behind if like it's always a you know a, it's always a you know a voter die situation or an armageddon situation meanwhile you know i'm looking around this motherfucker and like things have not gotten better so it's like and then you start to take a look at some of these people like unfortunately my district is represent is represented in Congress by one of the most reprehensible people of color that I have ever known, Bitchy Torres. Excuse me, Richie Torres, the most <laughs> out, the most out and full throat, dick flute saluting Zionist that I that we've ever seen. Mm-hmm. Like bought and paid like a million mm-hmm. in with a with APAC. Yeah, and just you know. Coming to un- coming to see and understand that no, the grass is not greener on the other side. They're green on both sides, and a lot of things are bipartisan. You know, this foreign policy that we have to deal with that's unfolding in front of us is bipartisan. Yeah. Um, building cop cities is partisan. Oh yeah, keeping the keeping the petite bourgeois separate from the working class by mm-hmm. making them think that their interests are are different from ours. That's bipartisan with them, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, and again, like I said, I live in New York. My vote doesn't necessarily matter as electoral college wise because I'm not in I'm not mm-hmm. in one of five or six battleground states where my vote yeah. matters. So, you know, just under you know, the more you come to learn and the more you start to see the game and the theater and everything like that, you know, you can't help but become cynical and in in a lot of ways so for me like 
yes, I will be glad it's over so we won't have, you know, folks, you know, crying on Twitter about, you know, oh, you don't, you know, oh, so you don't, you know, what does Kamala have to do with what's going on over and over in Gaza and blah, 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 blah. You know, we won't necessarily have to deal with so much of, of brain dead questions like those. Mm-hmm. And I think that's all, those are all genuine concerns to me. Yeah. Like, that's part of the reason why I will never, ever give anybody shit for voting for third parties or voting other ways. I'm never going to do that because first off, you should have a right to vote for who you want to. It should never be a situation where you should be shamed into voting for somebody else. Yeah. Um, you know, for me, the most important thing about voting is just the voting act itself the act of voting itself is so crucial in democracy because it's one of the things that should be grant to, uh, granted to us in the in the Constitution. It's part of the reason I vote. But I recognize going in that like that a lot of the differences between the two major parties are some of them are symbolic. But and you're right, some of them are very symbolic, right? I mean, I think when it comes to the issue of the border, I think they're all trying to kind of outright wing each other on it. I think when it comes to the issue, especially of the uh, of the the whether it's the continued, um, you know, war in Ukraine or the genocide in Gaza, it's just like there's no end to the money tap for that. But when it comes to like taking care of our people, especially in these horrific storms that we've been dealing with, Hurricane Helena, now Hurricane Milton, you know, I mean, they're very small countries like Cuba and Vietnam that have very good disaster preparedness. And these are small, relatively poor countries to the United, compared to the United States. And yet somehow they take care of their people much better in situations like this than we do. Yeah. And that's, I think that that's very the frustrating how long, has Cuba, how long has Cuba been under sanction? Over 60 years. 60 years. Right? Yeah. Yet they have much better, much, they have, they have much better trained medical professionals than we do. So much to the point that they get to go overseas to other, other countries, request their assistance, and they send their doctors to like, to like other countries overseas. It's just, it's you know. Meanwhile, we're you know we're supposedly in the mo- in you know the biggest, baddest, most you know richest country, you know baddest mofo on the block. Yet it's in the intention, like the, in- the I'm probably making up a word, the intentionality in which it goes out of its way to not provide for its population if they don't fit certain boxes. Yeah. It's just, yeah. it's just, it's, you know, it's yeah. monstrous. You know, again, I live in a supposedly demo, a supposedly blue city, a city that's where the majority of people in power are the Democrats. Yet we are the most policed. I live in a mm-hmm. district with the most poor working class people, the most people living in food resource and, you know, housing insecurities. And we have to deal with, you know, the biggest gang on the planet, NYPD, getting billions mm. and billions of dollars. Meanwhile, they continue to cut funds and budgets from, you, from, you know, from, you, you know, municipal services that help people, you know, cutting from public assistance, from food stamps, you know, housing vouchers. I can't remember the last time. I can't even remember when the last time they opened up applications for like Section 8 housing. Mm-hmm. I think it's been closed for like a pretty it's for a very long time, you know. Even like over the summer, us having to deal with you know with library hours being cut and library what? you know on the on the chopping block for being closed. But yeah, record like, overtime, record overtime for the NYPD, right? I mean, this yeah. is like this is the, know, it's I, the, such messed up priorities. Yeah, so, yeah, and you know, and it's just like how can you know it's and it's it's hard to see people who are not hip to the situation, but I understand it because, you know, folks who are not hip to it, it's intentional because we're dealing with all of these other issues, all these interconnected issues on a daily basis that, you know, we're trying to keep our head above water. So it's, yeah. it's a, it's, a, it's almost a privilege to be like, to be, you know, I guess, you know, politically savvy and mm-hmm. un- and understanding how connected everything is. Yeah. You know, so and so that's I guess that's where the dilemma comes in. So how do you how do we motivate people to understand that like, yeah, you know, things really don't have to be th- the, the way that they are the way that they are. It's intentional to divert your attention from from what's from how many ways that, you know, 
that you're that you're intentionally being fucked by people who say that they who go off to you know Washington D.C. and say that they represent you and they really don't. Mm. Oh, go ahead, Chrissy. Yeah, I, I just um, as somebody who's actually I I didn't realize how similar we are. I'm also a home care worker. Um, I don't know. Are you a union member? I yes, I am. Yes, I, SEIU, SEIU 1199. Nice. Yeah, very much so. <laughs> so um, not that even with that. Oh, my goodness. I don't know how things are out in your neck of the woods. But my training was um, if you go in and they ask you to take care of their dogs, don't do it. Also, be very careful about your hours or you will be committing fraud. You know? Oh, oh absolutely. Um, <laughs> I, was, I, I was fortunate that I'm, I'm fortunate that, yeah, the people I work with, they don't have pets. It's pretty, it's pretty, you know, go to, it's pretty simple stuff, you know, assist folks with, you know, their ADLs, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. sometimes amulate them, transfer them and stuff like that, you know. And also be like, you know, part caretaker, part therapist or yes. um, or peer counselor, part, you know, associate, you know, friend. <laughs> with their paperwork, with Medicare, whatever it needs. Yeah, so. you're, you're so many things, you know. Part, you know. <laughs> it's, isn't that an indictment of the system, as it were, too, that we need people to help people in order to uh, fill out the paperwork and the bureaucracy? Oh, okay. Yeah. No, yeah. Well, yeah. Blind leading the Oh, yeah. And just the fact, you know, and that's another thing going on top of trying to make the bureaucracy more of a pain in the ass so less people will go and seek out the help that they need. Yeah. Because they'll, they'll be put through the rigmarole and they will be judged by people who are supposed to help them. Oh, well, why, oh, can't, yeah. you, why can't you go get this type of job or that type of job? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, and it's like, excuse me? I have I have a friend that like has not gotten there that moved to a state and has not gotten their like driver's license or ID card for the new state that they lived in because well one there's tra- they're trans so that's a whole another mix mm. there's dark skin like the next that has a whole nother have to be autistic too another whole mix but then they're on SSI and they don't want to even like do anything that could threaten that because yeah. like if there's any suspicion yeah. whatsoever. And it's all from like the times before they lost their SSI for one month and they had had a streamer friend like raise $700 in order to pay rent because like they needed the SSI to pay rent. And when they lost it for just one month because of clerical error, it was a big warning sign as well, too. So. Yeah, you know, you go, I go into these places, you know, because sometimes they'll, you know, like they've done things like they'll they'll send you a letter saying that, oh, well, you know, you have to hurry up and, and you know, resubmit your application. Otherwise, you're just going to get, you're going to get cut off from your systems and shit. And, you know, you go into these offices and you'll see how, how, you know, they're, they're really not staffed. They really don't have enough staff. Yeah. There. Like, all of this is intentional. They, yes. they, you know, they cut, as they continue to cut budgets, it means that they're going to be low on staff. So you're going to be stuck there for like, you know, you might as you have to take a day off work because you're going to be yes. stuck there for like hours on end just to handle this one little thing so that you don't lose benefits that you need. Otherwise, you know, you'll starve or you'll be late on rent or, you know, you won't be able to get your kid clothes that they need for school and stuff like that. You know, and this is not just symp- this is not just symptomatic of what happens to folks in red states. This, oh, is, it's, this, it's, this is what happens in blue states, too. So yeah. you know, the idea of, you know, of not of, of the idea of, you know, the whole Protestant work ethic thing in regards to how we treat the poor and working mm-hmm. class, you know, that's very bipartisan. So um, I'm, I bring that around to bring that some uh, bring that back to something that you said, Steve, in regards yeah. to, you know, how they how the Democrats have been, you know, squeamish on, you know, seeming being, you know, painted as soft on police or soft on the border control. I think yeah. it may be that, but like at this point in the game, for them to continue with that, you you, you kind of start to think that maybe it's not just a, 
a defense mechanism for party reasons, you you start to think that like there are definitely there are definitely dog there, are show. there are difficult political principles that they do share with the other side. They just go about expressing them differently. I you know? I do think a lot of that. I mean, I I don't disagree. It's one of my biggest frustrations with the party is you know the fact that and may, whether it's whether it's because they feel like it's their their best political strategy or whether these kinds of values have actually been internalized and you know the people in charge of sort of charting the course for the party genuinely believe that the best way to deal with police violence is to just throw more money at the police or the best way to deal with uh Benjamin Netanyahu and the the government of Israel is to just let them keep doing whatever they want like i don't know if it's a calculation or if it's and you know a deeply held value but it is something that i wish that we would get over um i mean it's something that I, it goes back longer than this, but in my lifetime, I tend to trace it back to the Clinton administration because Clinton, uh, Cl Bill Clinton wanted to be remembered as an effective president. He wanted yeah. to be remembered as a president that got things done. And he knew after his first midterms, when the Republicans took over, he sort of made a decision to say, OK, well, I'm going to find ways to work with the Republicans and get legislation passed and if that means that I have to shift to the right, then I guess that's just what I'll have to do. And that was a part of his election strategy, too. Clinton was the first Democratic candidate to uh, to to employ what they called the, tri the uh, triangulation strategy, where he was not just aiming at Democrats and liberals and progressives and people on the left. He was trying to aim toward the center and bring in Republicans who maybe weren't so happy with uh, you know, George H.W. Bush or Bob Dole in 96. And ever since that, and that worked really well for Clinton, but the problem is ever since, it's like every Democrat thinks that's the only way that a Democrat could ever win an election, a national election. Yeah. Well, and, and I've said before, and, and I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt you, but like no, I would go even further back to us get uh, to the liberals getting their asses handed to them uh, throughout the 80s mm -hmm. and early. Yeah, just... I mean, the Mondale and the Dukakis runs were, yeah. they were humiliating. They were humiliations. There's no other two ways about them. And which is why I, I think then when uh, Bill Clinton came in and showed this, this third way, uh, he was treated as this magical, oh, this is how we do this now. And, uh, you know, I also live in a blue state. Um, and we're doing some good things. You know, I live in Massachusetts and uh, several of the questions uh, are specifically our little questions that you get are specifically related to um, letting Uber drivers and, and people of, you know, gig economy people unionize, um, having some kind of base rate pay for service workers that would generally only rely on tips, you know. So these are all good things. But one thing that, uh, well, there's a couple things that have happened. Uh, one is Massachusetts, it's become bougie to the point of just absurdity. And, and mm -hmm. we have... Yeah. We have pushed people out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's funny if I say that. I, it's it's the same. Pro I think it's a, I think that's an issue. A lot of traditionally um, Democrat run cities and states sort of run into. Mm -hmm. You know, that's definitely been a thing with New York, uh, especially, you know, hyper gentrification, right? Mm -hmm. Housing prices. You know, I remember I was out late at night because. You know, there are bodegas in my neighborhood that are 24 hours still. So I was out late getting a sandwich and I was talking to someone, you know, because I don't see many white people in my neighborhood. So when I do, it's a thing. So and he told me that he had been priced out of a neighborhood in Manhattan, Washington mm -hmm. Heights, which is traditionally um, more Hispanics uh, live live in that in that part of uh, in that neighborhood in Manhattan traditionally. But 
Manhattan has always been traditionally uber expensive, you know, because that's where, you know, nine times out of 10, that's those are where the elites live. They live in Manhattan, right? So to hear, to hear a white person say that they were priced out of Manhattan, that they were priced out of Washington Heights and that they had to find somewhere in the Bronx to live, which has also increasingly become more expensive, you know, since hyper, you know, gentrification got to us late. But it's definitely here, you know, Mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, you see it symbolically when I see more Starbucks, when I see certain types of restaurants I've never seen before, when I see more city bike stations pop up that that lets me know, like, oh, boy, there. Yeah. Mm, Once you see this, once you see the line, like uh, uh, strollers or something like that, or the like, just like you use your phone app to like, buy, and now you can ride this bike. Yeah, Yeah. the yuppies have all comments. This was all uh, started in reference. Sorry, yeah. But Uh, but yeah, I I definitely, I agree. Like, Chrissy, that's, uh, you know, having like traditionally democratic, I guess those democratic bastion cities and states. Yeah. How they become more uh, bougie at the time because they're yeah. pushing, they're pushing out the the you know the poor working class. They're pushing yeah. out you know us you know the undesirables as mm-hmm. it were, you know. So they still need us because eventually yeah, they get they, old exactly. and they need no healthcare. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, because you know we keep the wheel going. You know, they, yes. they need us. They need you someone know, to drive the buses. Exactly. They need someone to drive the buses. Yeah. They need someone to, you know, serve them their their lattes at Starbucks. They need mm-hmm. someone to put burgers at Shake Shack. You know, they mm-hmm. need folks to deliver their food, you know, via DoorDash, you know, the all the, you know, 5011 apps that are all owned by the same mega corporation. Yeah. You know? So yeah, so they, they need those folks to, you know, deliver their food and everything like that. They just make it super hard for us to live. Live. <laughs> or, even, or even exist. You know what I mean? Like, they don't, don't want to look at people who have to serve them. <laughs> you know. Exactly. Quite <laughs> frankly, they would, be, they would probably like, be more you know, comfortable being that, robots. And, and these yeah. things are and these things are bipartisan. You can find yes, them in any, you know, you can find them in any state, you know. That's why some liberals may get offended when you say that Democrats and Republicans are the two sides of the same coin, but yeah. it's true, you know, and, ways, yes. you know it, it's, it's true. Like, you know, at least like, and when folks nowadays, when, when, you know, when liberals get mad at, you know, leftists, I guess, you know, which it, I guess it includes socialists and anarchists and, you know, sock dims or whatever and when they when i hear complaints from folks who are like oh y'all are really focusing on getting on the democrats more than the republicans i'm just like we already know i i already know where i stand with republicans mm-hmm. yeah. they don't like my yeah. ass yeah, yeah. <laughs> they think I'm, they think I'm very who's this who's best made for you know hard labor Mm-hmm. Or, you know, or to be in or, you know, or to, you know, or, or to be, you know, like a nanny or a cleaning lady. Mm-hmm. I mean, this was they, want me to, they, they want me to starve. They don't think I deserve, you know, to be, you know, to be taken care of or to be or to be assisted or anything like that. I already know where they stand with them. I already know where I stand with Trump. I already know what will get when and whenever if ever republicans come into power because they've shown us they go to the same shit all the time the republicans you know and and you know which was surprised which was it was surprising to me that they got molly walked during the midterms mm. you know but yeah folks already saw what they were about they they don't make any they, they don't you know they you know once trump came into play you know euphemisms went out the window there's no and yeah. even and even with some of them don't, a lot of them don't even bother with euphemisms. So we already know where we stand with them. Yeah. And I think when, when it comes to, into, when we look into the issues of what's really, what's really harming people on not just symbolically, but materially, you will see a demo, you see a Democrat behind it, supporting it like it's nothing. You know what I'm saying? Like you saw like it's Kamala's up there saying, oh, we'll have the, you know, best and biggest and baddest army you bitches have ever seen. A Democrat saying that a Democrat is saying that she will always, you know, support a, you know, a, a, a white supremacist uh, vassal colony's right to exist. You know what I mean? Like, come on. Like you well, can't. 
you know, like, you, you know, it's, it's like folks are trying to get us to, to deny, to be in denial of what we're seeing. You know, it's almost like they're, they're trying to continue like this big, like one of the biggest gaslighting events I've ever seen. And that's another reason why I, I want the election. I want this shit to be over already. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and this yeah. is part of like, and this is a long-term trend. I mean, we, we've talked about Clinton, we've talked about the Reagan era, but to me, a lot of the problems of the democratic party go way back. I mean, a lot of it goes back to the early 1970s. Um, I think that the real beginning of the democratic party moving away from being ostensibly the party of working people, or at least a name of being the party of working people mm -hmm. really starts with the McGovern campaign in 72, arguably yeah. one of the more liberal campaigns. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, some random geek and I, before we, got on here, we were talking about Thomas Frank's excellent book, Listen Liberal, which I think yeah. is like pretty much required reading if you want to understand why the Democrat, why the Democratic Party has been so bad the last 20 to 30 years mm -hmm. is, is because of the neoliberal turn. It's, it's mm -hmm. and, oh. and, and, and to me, it's, it's all about this idea of, you know, um, Margaret Thatcher said her greatest achievement was new labor. It was yes. New Blair, right? Yeah, exactly. And because Ronald like Reagan's and Ronald Reagan's greatest achievement is Bill Clinton. Because yeah. it was to take a party, which was supposed to be the party of working people, it was supposed to be the party of unions, was supposed to be the party of the working class, ostensibly, right? Because in America, we don't really have a left party, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, as Gore Vidal once said, you know, in the United States, we have one party. It's the property party, and it has two right wings, Republicans, <laughs> the Democrats, right? <laughs> and so we don't really have a left party, but the Democratic Party is ostensibly left in this weird, nonsensical, awful Overton window that we have in America. So, you know, you see this this fear of like wanting to support things that people would would largely get upon. And I think Democrats are just afraid. They're so afraid of, I think, alienating those white suburban voters who may vote de Republican, but they also might vote Democrat. Mm. But that's even a smaller, you know, I just wish that for once they would just try the other option, which is to like run a genuinely like social democratic campaign where they listen to their base. Cause that's the big difference between Republicans and Democrats. Republicans absolutely embrace their base and the base becomes the party, right? They did it with the Tea party. They did it with Trump. Democrats, the democratic leadership hates its base. They, they, yes. they hold them in contempt. So it's, it's, you know, they're going to do whatever they're going to do. The reason that Biden's not running has really nothing to do with like his conscience. It is to do with the fact that the donors of which mm -hmm. he's been very comfortable with his entire life said, mm -hmm. uh, you, we will no longer give you any money. That's yeah. it. And I yeah. mean, that's one of the big reasons he's out, right? Among many other ones. Um, but I think that's a big part of it. Yeah. And yeah. so yeah. that's the real yeah. challenge is to get out of this, this sort of binary or this sort of crappy neoliberal thinking of like, can we get beyond this? And it's like, I think that, you know, Bernie Sanders' two campaigns show that there's a hunger for that within the sort of social democratic left or the sort of so democratic social set, there's a hunger for that broader social democratic policy, which would not have seemed out of place in the, you know, in the 1950s, right? It's like, that's yeah. the part that's so crazy is in America that our policies are used far to the right, that things people would have seen as totally normal in the 1950s are, are considered radical now. Um, whether it be like national health care or or um, higher taxes on the rich. I mean, yeah. remember, like, you know, the, the, the marginal tax, the highest marginal tax rate in, in the United States of America was in the 1950s, was like 91 percent. Right. Yeah. So like there were very high taxes on wealthy people, you know, and I think a lot of this stems from this massive inequality. A lot of the social breakdown, yeah. a lot of the problems we see is from this uh, inequality. And I don't believe at this particular juncture that despite despite feeling that I do think that on very specific things and in very specific contexts that Harris and the Democrats are better than Trump and the Republicans, like neither one of them is like talking about those things because if we did, then like, you know, that, because that gets, and Republicans don't really want to talk about it at all. I mean, they, they would love to just do full culture, culture war shit because then yes. it would yeah. allow yeah. them to just do whatever they want to do, which is to, um, you know, basically Remove all taxes on the rich, super yeah. basically has a tax cut that only like twelve people benefit from, right? They their base. They know how to emotionally motivate them, and nothing, yeah. and nothing motivates a yeah. bigoted person more than letting them know that their adversaries are, are you know, are becoming more powerful and they're becoming powerless, you know, and sort of redirecting, you know whatever whatever justified existential dread that they're having in the world because 
They mm-hmm. can't meet their, because they can't meet their basic needs. You know, their their lives materially are going down the shitter, but they're mm-hmm. being given different res- reasons to distract from the actual reason. So. Right. Yes. And I think that's the bigger trouble is, is that when it comes down to it, um, you know, the reason that I'm so hard on the Democrats is because it genuinely, one, I, I do believe that they could potentially be better. And two, they have been better in the past. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing. Like, and, and again, like, the New Deal was at a very limited, it, extremely limited, right? It yeah. left out African Americans. Yeah. It left out women. It left out mm-hmm. agriculture workers, right? I know that. And there were a lot of issues with the Great Society. But it, mm-hmm. but these two programs were some of the broadest social democratic policies in America had ever seen. And they led to probably, arguably, probably one of the greatest periods of economic growth and broader prosperity the world had ever seen, which was post-World War II to the early 1970s, where yeah. even people... In, in even African Americans were seeing real economic gains in that period, simply by virtue of the fact that you had a much more leveled playing field. When you when you decrease inequality, when you really deal with the issue of inequality, then you are able to actually do the real things and have wages keep up with productivity, which they haven't in the last 40 years, right? Yeah. Where Americans yeah. can actually have a savings account, which they used to have 40, 50 years ago, yeah. and yeah, they're now debtors. Have- yeah, so I mean, that's the trouble, right? And and all of the sort of culture war stuff, which again, it's not, it's it, it isn't like it's it's not important because some of it is, right? Like when people say, "Oh, I don't care about culture war stuff," I'm like, "I'm sorry, but like, you know, healthcare decisions for for women and for trans people are very important to me. I don't see that as like a niche thing or a culture war thing. That's a very material yeah. thing, right? Yeah, but." these sort of weird debates that we get into ignore from the fact that the broader structural problems. And I think that's the big limitation of these sort of election cycles is that they become about the horse race and it all becomes about statistics and sort of vibes rather than talking about the real issues. So my thinking on the subject is, is one very similar to Noam Chomsky's, which is the amount of time that you should consider an election is about 10 minutes, which is that you should just read who the candidates are, (laughs) Yeah. Read who they might be, vote for who the people you are best, and then move on and do other more important things, mm-hmm. whether it's organizing, yeah. education, yeah. mutual aid, and just do the work of like building the better world because the people in power will not do it, regardless of how nice they might be or might, nice they might, they might seem, they're not going to do it because it's not in their interest to. Yeah, exactly. It's not in yeah. their ideological or their material interest to do so. And I think that's sort of the, that's the blind spot that a lot of liberals have or either have or have and sort of hide behind it. Because, you know, whenever it comes to the, whenever the discussion shifts over to the possibility of third parties, you know, opening up our political system to something more like they have in in England or something like that, where there are, or even in Canada where there's more than two parties, right? You know, there's always- Is there though? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there, right? But you know, just You're right. the possibility of you know giving people more than these two choices that were that were that were sort of that have us in a stranglehold. Yeah, and folks are like, oh, well, you know, that's nice, but that's wishful thinking. We have to sort of get to this now, and I feel like, especially like now, given you know. The Green Party's recent, you know, given, you know, recent things, you know, with the, you know, the candidates going on a breakfast club, with them getting more interviews, and more prominence, um, the Biden, the, excuse me, the Biden, the abandoned Harris movement publicly endorsing the Green Party. Like, there are significant moves that have been made that have opened up the door to the possibility that, no, we don't have to just deal with business as usual and it take it and it will take and it, it it shows even more that it will take folks being willing to step out of whatever small comfort zone that they have cuz it's it really comes down to whether or not we who are you know in the heart of empire in the belly of the beast it, it yeah. really it really does come down to whether we are willing to go through an inkling of this, not even inkling, an 18th of an inkling of the suffering 
uh, like those in the global south and over in the Middle East, you know, Gaza, Lebanon specifically yeah. are going through. And I feel that if we can't even do that, then, you know, what does that say? Then what does that say about us that we're more willing to just continue to, to perpetuate the status quo because we have whatever creature comforts that we have right now? You know, things are maybe, you know, they are what they are, depending on depending on where you are, I guess, at, you know, your station is. But there's still some comfort in knowing that that may or that may not change significantly. It won't get worse. So if, if we're not willing to challenge that, to throw that off to the side, then what does that say about us as as a society? You know what I mean? And, you know, especially, you know, I look at all the protests and everything and certain folks complaining about that. And it's like, these are protests. They're supposed to, you're supposed to be inconvenienced. They're supposed to be inconveniencing because these people are not okay with how the status quo is. So you you can't demand people, you know, like, oh, well, can, uh, can you guys just not pull this protest like during morning rush hour? Because that would really inconvenience <laughs> No, yeah. <laughs> like we're standing on principle about something here, you know. So, and that's for me. That's another reason why I think, you know, it, we 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 do have there is a window of opportunity to say to the ruling class that, listen, you guys have been shitty on the job for the longest time, and we're kind of looking to fire you on that. <laughs> <laughs> Because they're so, you know, they're so willing to like discard us, you know, at will, at will hire and firing and shit like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Little sorts of labor protections and shit like that. You know, I think when the, when the opportunity presents itself, it's, it would behoove up, it's on us to show that, yeah, you know, actually on second thought, mm, I'm not really happy with the job you guys have been doing. I think you guys should be suspended for a while or, <laughs> or, you know, or just, or, or, if, if, or even if you're not going to do that, like if you, if you decided like, okay, fuck it, I'm just going to, you know, all this other stuff, that's nice and everything, but we got to deal with what's in, I got to deal with what's in front of my face right now. So even if you're like that, like, be better than, you know, uncommitted and actually continue to hinge your vote on something that, Hey, I listen, like you are not the choice that I, you're not the person I want to choose. However, I will go with you if you do a, B, C, and D. Yeah. This, imagine if we like, had, like, like, okay. I do like, eventually we fire at will our politicians. Oh my God. I want to see that. Honestly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and to just, you know, the un- uncommitted had, they had a little something, but I was a little mm. concerned because they were traditionally democratic voters, especially in the primary. Mm. They, they vote how the party tells them to vote traditionally, you know, but there was a glimmer of hope. But then after the, after, you know, the DNC after, and after, so. after the convention, mm-hmm. after the DNC not allowing any Palestinian to yeah. give a speech and anything like that, Uncommitted was just like, they wrote a letter to their folks and they were just like, yeah, they did that. Yeah, they effed us over, mm-hmm. but we still got to go with, you know, what other choice do we have? Remain uncommitted. That's the choice that you have. Have. I thought that's what like her- that they couldn't even go with that. It's like yeah. you guys are you, you guys are petit bourgeois. Your lives will not, you know, your lives will not change that drastically, regardless who wins. You guys have the most to gain from you know letting these people know that no, we're actually not gonna go along with business as usual. You actually have to earn our vote. You're not entitled yeah. to it, you know. So it's just I guess that that's just really where I am right now. Ever since, you know, again, I voted for Biden out of fear and seeing, and I saw how things were going and I was just like, I'm, I'm just not doing that again. Uh, and even, you know, with me being the proletariat poor working class person that I am, I know that I'm in a relative position of privilege that again, I can stand on principle because I don't live in the battleground state. Yeah. Folks who do, I think they have a bigger decision to make. Yeah. 
if anything, in my limited failed influencer capacity. If I could influence or inspire anything, I would hope to inspire just a little bit of courage. And here's the thing. If it fails, if the Green Party, you know, let's say you vote green or whatever and it fails and, you know, you know, regardless if Kamala wins or Trump wins or whatever, if it fails. So what? Like, you know, you guys like to say that Rome wasn't built in the day. Well, you things don't change within like a win. You have to continue to build on momentum. For, for the things that you want and realize that like, yeah, you be willing to put yourself in a position of discomfort or a position of where you're going to have to fight a bit more fiercely, depending on who gets in office. I mean, fight fiercely regardless. But, yeah, yeah, I agree with that. So just be, just understand that that's what the situation is and be ready for it. You know, we've always been in of the thinking of we elect politicians to handle the shit for us so that we can deal with with everything that life is throwing at us because you know we have limited bandwidth limited attention to so many things mm -hmm. but now it's been it's shown to us that it really behooves us that we have to pay attention we have to be on top of these things because mm -hmm. the people whom we've given this power to take care of shit that we can't take care of, not only are they slacking on, not only have they been slacking on the job, they're intentionally not fighting in our material and political interests. So yeah. I, I, uh, I've kind of been listening the whole time, just with my interjections now and then, but this always brings up to me uh, the anarchist theory of means and ends. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so long as we rely on a political system that's run by the bourgeois, as long as you rely on a state, you will never achieve the ends that we want. Yeah. Because the means simply do not allow for it. The mm -hmm. only thing that we can do in our capacity as community members, society members, is build grassroots, grassroots movements and mm -hmm. work, you know, on mutual aid. Uh, you know, defending ourselves, setting up situations where we could take care of our, ourselves. And then eventually we will have to confront the state because they will come after us. But mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's really all we can do. Right. Is set, is take care of ourselves because the state never actually will. Hmm, that's yeah. interesting. I haven't delved that far into into anarchism. So this is so this is more of a. <laughs> The learning. This is this is the learning hour for me. And, uh, <laughs> well, yeah. I'm an I'm an I guess, and I wanted to study more of this the things as well too. Curious of like how the Zapatistas, the Jobs Mexico, like run things, or or like other additions like communities how they run things, or like yeah. uh, how the uh, people of the northeast of uh, Syria, Kurdistan, or Rojava run yeah. things. Well, Democratic history. So because like I. I like to imagine, like, uh, that's right, the Vilkin in the chat said, like, a dual power, which, like, yes, Lyndon wrote something about, like, dual power, but that was the idea that came up from, like, a pure Joseph Proudhon, the mutualist as well, too. I believe we call it alternatives systems of power. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> but, like, yeah, so it's just kind of like, it, so it, do I say go out and vote? I say, if you're passionate about voting, sure, go ahead. I, I, I'm not going to stop you. But yeah. if it is... And vote how you want to as well too i won't judge anyone if they vote for the democrats or third party i kind of said if you vote for the second party i will judge you unless it's like a very particular local candidate who somehow is not a trumpian then okay i'll give you that pass as well too. i will <laughs> yeah, I, would have, I would have a hard time yeah. giving so i've I've had arguments with friends with about this. The other like, people. <laughs> that's yeah, true. That's true. Exactly. <laughs> I've I, I've had arguments with friends about this where it's like they say, oh, but it's a local office and I've met them and they're a really good person. Oh, OK, well, then why are they still registered? Why are they still a Republican if they're such <laughs> yes. a good person? I, I mean, exactly. I, I. Yeah. Yeah. My, yeah. I mean, my my frustration as a as a Democrat, as a as a. A, a, a lowercase and an uppercase D Democrat <laughs> is <laughs> is that I because I feel I feel annoyance at 
parties on both ends. You know what I mean? Like I feel I'm some I'm sometimes annoyed at what I perceive to be the lack of pragmatism on the part of third party voters. And I'm also annoyed at my party for always worrying about the impact that third party voters will have on an election and never asking ourselves, well, why aren't they voting for us? Yeah, Mm -hmm. because I I feel like there's there's a lack there. There's a and and because the Democratic Party is one of the two major parties in the country and therefore it's sort of in the more powerful position relative to third party voters, I tend to put more of the blame on them Mm -hmm. than on third party voters, Um, because if I were if I were in charge of the Democratic Party, if I were part of the party establishment and I knew that every two or four years especially every four years during a presidential election and especially in certain crucial swing states that I would have to worry about whether or not we were going to lose the election because there was a statistically significant amount of people who, if there were no other alternatives, would vote for us. But because there are other alternatives, they would rather vote for a third party candidate that has no chance at all of winning the election than vote for us. Why aren't they voting for us? And instead of blaming them, which I think is often the instinct to say like, well, they're impossible to please or they they won't ever vote for us no matter what we say. Instead of just sort of taking that for granted, why not do a little introspection and be like, well, but why aren't they voting for us? Like because- if the choice, if, if they know that it's either going to be us or the Republicans and if they had to choose between just us, they would choose us. So they prefer us to the Republicans, at least on some level, but not enough to actually vote for us. Why aren't they voting for us? And it goes back to the the Bill Clinton triangulation third way thing where Democrats, again, especially sort of mainstream uh, political class Democrats, they have they they have just internalized this idea that in order to win elections, especially to win you know national level elections, they have to get Republicans to vote for them. And I feel like you know Justin, you mentioned going back to McGovern. I feel like every it's a cycle that's been repeating itself. Every single time there's a big swell of Republican support, and Republicans win a big election, it's like the Democrats think. Oh, okay. Well, we have to be more like them, and they forget about the times when they won elections on a massive scale. Yeah. What the party was like then, mm-hmm. and they're you know, and and there's instead of constantly defaulting to how can we how can we play to the center, how can mm-hmm. we attract, how can we peel off some voters from the right to vote for us instead of that. And again, I mean, as a as as a skeptical person and as a person who tries to have a an evidence based worldview i have to 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 you know make it clear that this is mostly just a feeling i have i don't really have statistics to back this up it's just kind of a sense i have but i feel like there are enough people in the country who are of a left leaning or further to the left than that you know orientation politically that if the democrats did actually commit to not constantly trying to appeal to the Republicans or not constantly trying to tailor their message so that it doesn't alienate Republicans. And they actually made a, a, a serious effort to appeal to progressives and to people further to the left and say, hey, we want to hear what you want and we want we want you to vote for us, not just, you know, you better vote for us or the yeah, alternative is worse. Yeah. But we really <laughs> want you to vote for us. Mm-hmm. That so, I feel like that would be a much that would be a winning strategy. You yeah, know? but and I think uh, part of the reason. I, yeah, I, think, I was just going to say mention yeah. re- briefly, real quick, because I think the role of the unions is very important to piggyback yes. off of Steve's point. So, one thing that's happened in this election cycle, which I'm very happy about, is that the Teamsters didn't endorse anybody for president. So I think that's actually <laughs> I think that's a very good thing, and I'll explain why. It says a it, it's 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 a loud statement. It's a very loud statement, and it's the statement that unions should have. This idea that I personally believe that ever since that the 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 mainstream unions in America have sort of hitched their wagons to the Democrats, it's been like kind of their it's kind of been their death spiral yes. because I think unions should be independent and should and should push the parties to be better. If you're if yeah. you're always going to be committed to the Democrats, the Democrats are in no they have no reason to ever be better for you. 
because if you're mm-hmm. always going to vote for them, they will never have it. And so back during the New Deal, especially, and during mm-hmm. the Great Society, mm-hmm. you saw labor strikes all the time. We think mm-hmm. about the, 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 we think about the dock workers that just went on strike. There was a yeah. massive dock worker strike that happened in 1937, mm-hmm. right? Like the, the, the New Deal didn't happen just because FDR was like, so wonderful that he wanted to give this everybody. He was oh. responding to a vibrant left political movement, yeah. largely led by the, Amer- the, the Communist Party of the United States and by political radicals of a variety of different stripes. So I mean, one way I yeah. think that the Democratic Party can actually be pushed and be better on the left is for unions to be being more, more independent, to say yeah. you have to earn our support. You, we just don't give okay. it to you anymore. Oh, I agree. And especially given how, you know, it was democratic policies via the whole third way thing that it's it kind of led to unions being like banged over the years. Yeah. Like I remember my first job, my very first job was with a supermarket, a supermarket chain. Within 90 days, I was in the union. I had full benefits, even though I was a part timer. So I had access to regular medical um I dental um, and a life insurance benefit and stuff. And to see so many chains these days that folks are like working and they're 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 almost part time, but not quite because they don't do a full a full 40 hours and they're not unionized and like the corp- you know whatever corporation owns like owns their company goes out of their way to you know have folks come and ex- and you know give uh propaganda anti-union propaganda and stuff like that just to know that that exists in this day yeah. and that that I could see it especially coming from what I knew about unions and and how strong they used to be it's so it's so crushing even for me today as you know as a home care worker who is with a, a pretty good union you know and just seeing how defanged they've all become but seeing the resurgence now and seeing the resurgence of folks um going on strike seeing the auto workers go on strike seeing the rail workers go on strike, even though Biden kind of stepped in and stopped it, but then like, you know, backpedaled around and did something that I guess he, you know, was hoping that would wipe out the fact that he kind of ruled like, hey, bitches, stop striking because things need to get through. Or whatever. I think I heard now, I heard from my friend John Brockman that he did work to get, like, make sure those uh, railroad rail world workers get everything that they were demanding for. So, right. Like, uh, yeah. And I'll be completely honest with you, too. Like, I think that there are decisions that the Biden administration has made that the Obama administration would not have made. Like, in my opinion, like, I think in this recent um, in the recent um, dock worker strike, like, I don't think Obama would have been as good to them as Biden was. Oh, I just don't think so. Yeah, Um, Just knowing just knowing. And that's the one thing I will give. Biden credit for on that specific mm-hmm. thing because mm-hmm. yeah, as much I, I as, know that he's, yeah. he's sort of known for you know being yeah. like a bit pro union, which is why when when the rail strike happened and he made that first decision to make them stop striking, I was like, wow, really? Mm-hmm. Hmm. And I I'd like to throw well, something out about unions too, and and some of the strikes that have gone on, um, and it's going back I think to Justin's point about how culture war things cannot be disentangled uh, from these sorts of things. Because one of the things that unions have been striking about is things like sexual harassment and assault. Yes. Yes. Or, uh, you know, uh, racist abuse is a big one, like discrimination. So none of these things are, are able to just be sort of pulled apart into separate things. Because if you're a worker, uh, you know, name a name a woman worker that you know that hasn't been sexually harassed at work. I couldn't right. do it. <laughs> I couldn't. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's another reason why I get so angry at liberals when they're like, "Oh, well, you're not voting for Kamala just because of you know Gaza and, and Palestine and stuff." You know, trying to reduce our concerns to like single issue concerns, and, and it's like, no, never. These things have never been single single issues because no one. No one person lives a single issue life. All of these things are interconnected. There may be 
some sort of a, you know, a hierarchy or whatever. So like, let's say some folks are like, oh, how, how, like, I'm an atheist, right? So, Mm -hmm. and it's been, for me, it's been very quiet in regards to, you know, what's been going on in Gaza and Palestine, you know, and I'm also a, a secular humanist. So to me, what's been going on over there is like the humanist issue of our time and to see that a lot of these organizations, you know, talking about you, American Humanist Association, um, to see how they've just been focusing on like little, you know, church and state shit, you know, not that it doesn't require attention or whatever, but it's like, read the room, there's like a really big humanist issue going on overseas. But because you might, we might have differences in regards to as far as like, you know, religious beliefs and stuff like that. And sometimes some people may use that as a reason to sort of not get on board, especially with, you know, our resistance and everything like that. And I'm just like, I'm like, bitch, well, they can't, they can't fight for, you know, a person can't fight for, you know, for LGBTQ inclusion or whatever, if they're bombed into the stone age, Mm -hmm. you know, a person can't unlearn, you know, anti-queer bias or sexism and sexist thinking. If they're, if they're too tied up in, you know, wondering about, how am I going to keep my kid from starving because this settler colonial country has cut off our food and our water and our electricity and our internet? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. so for, so like, so like for me, it, it really, all these things, it's never for folks need to realize that these issues are, they're, they're not single issues and they never have been. Mm-hmm. You know, as a person of color, as someone who still has to deal with the amount of, you know, white supremacy. And, you know, and the airplanes flying over in Bronx. <laughs> that actually might have been a car on my road. There's flying over right now. So, yeah. You know, yeah. so I can relate to how inter- interconnected these issues are. Yeah. You know, so it's yeah. never, you know, again, so I guess that's... The, it's my frustration with the liberal side in regards yeah. to the whole, I think it's such you know, a, such a missed opportunity as well. Like, you yeah. know, one of the big things that I think that could really be, because I do really feel like we should have one of the mainstream parties in this country genuinely questioning whether or not we should be continually bombing multiple countries on any given day. <laughs> the fact that we have 800 military bases all over the world. I mean, yeah. there's always been this, I, 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 I kind of frame it like this. In American history, there's always been this push and pull between the sort of goals and aspirations, of what I would call the Republic, you know, the idea of, you know, the, the, the sort of democratic institutions that are built upon equality of rights and opportunities, you know, the Republic is represented by the best of what America has done. Right. Mm-hmm. When, it, when we think about things like the new deal or the great society and the war on poverty, the desegregation of public schools, like the good stuff that America has always done, but that's always at odds with the empire in the United States has yeah. always kind of been an empire. Yeah. And so it's this push and pull, right? And mm-hmm. to me, I think one of the, the biggest things that drives me nuts about presidential debates or presidential elections or congressional elections is there are really two things that often never get really that much coverage, and they are actually inextricably linked. One is the rise of American militarism, the fact that we spend more than the next 11 countries or 12 com- countries combined on our military every year. Yeah. That in, in terms of discretionary spending, it's like a trillion dollars every year goes towards the military, not to mention the fact that the Pentagon has never passed an audit. So there's just billions, if not trillions of dollars. That we don't know where they went. And the threat of climate change. Right. Yes. Hurricane Milton yeah. is ravaging, ravaging mm-hmm. Florida coast right now, the Gulf Coast. Yes. Right. The United States military is the lar- is one of the largest polluters in the world. Yeah. And the 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 crisis that we see in Gaza is not just a humanitarian one. It's a climate one. It's an environmental one. Right. You know, there are generations of olive and and cedar trees that are never going to come back because Mm -hmm. because Israel bombed them to holy hell with money and weapons that the United States sent them. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is the challenge. And it would be really nice for mainstream politicians to actually talk about this because I do think it's a threat. 
right? Like, Mm -hmm. you know, I do think it's a real threat to our future as a society because if, because, you know, America cannot be an empire forever. It can't. Yeah. You know, and, and I would make the argument that it's kind of a dying empire because we throw all of our money into violence instead of throwing it into our people. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and so I think that's really the challenge is that if the United States doesn't kind of wake up and recognize that we have wasted so much money and effort and time and human capital on violence Mm -hmm. and on war and on proxy wars and on, and, and on basically being, you know, because Israel, for all intents and purposes, is a colony of the United States. It does yeah. what we want. Yeah, Everything that, that it does, yeah. it could stop tomorrow if the United States said, you can't get to do this anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Period. People often think it's the other way around. that Like Israel controls American policy. No, 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 no. It's the other way around. Yeah. You know? and, and Biden got on the phone and was just like, bitch, we're not going to send you any more monies and weapons. Like It's all you have to do. I mean, all it's all literally all you have to do. And the thing is, is that when... The Biden administration sends money and weapons to Israel. It's actually in violation of the law. They're not supposed to actually do that. It's supposed to be authorized by Congress. Congress yeah. should reassert itself in its war powers, right? That's mm-hmm. kind of the other issue is having this sort of unitary executive deciding, well, which country am I going to bomb today? Like, that's a huge problem. And we haven't had a real discussion about that in a long time. And I think that's the disappointment that I see, um, especially when Democrats who 20 years ago were challenging George W. Bush. They were challenging the war in Iraq. They were challenging the continued war in Afghanistan. And they were challenging the torture program. Like they were, they were, there was a genuine effort to see these things being stopped. And a lot of the same horrific human rights abuses have happened now and nobody cares. It's like, it's like the mainstream of it has no main discussion of it. And I think that's a real disservice to the American people and it's a disservice to the world. So as I always say, in order for the republic to thrive, the empire has to die. It yeah. has to die. And and yeah. so, like, is that going to happen in election? No. Yeah. That's a long-term project. But yeah. it's going to have to happen. And so the question is, what is America going to be like after it's, after it's an empire? Is it going to be a sort of broader democratic society in which people own the means of production, in which we can actually build the world we seek to live? Or is it going to be barbarism? You know, Rosa Luxemburg said it, right. The binary is socialism or barbarism. That's Those are the options. And so yeah. to me, that's the challenge of our time. And, and, and those are the things I would really love to see people on not just the socialist, but the liberal left care about. Because I know that they do. I know there's a lot of people who are Democrats who feel the same way I do. I know there are. And, and I just wish that they had more power within their party. Yeah, I, I, I wish they had the strength of their of their voice of mm-hmm. what they want. Uh, yeah. You know, there's a lot of gaslighting of uh, this idea that it's it's just not pragmatic. It's just yeah. not pragmatic. Right. Yeah, just, yeah. We can't do it now. It's like, you know, we used to have a very vibrant pacifist uh, mm-hmm. movement in this country, which uh, I'm not a pacifist, but mm. I I feel also the loss of it now that it's sort of gone and gone away. And, and it's just yeah. because it, it feels like we have uh, we have told ourselves a story that this just will never work. It's not going to work uh, instead of telling us ourselves a story of what we could be or what we could do. We have limited ourselves without even trying, you Uh know, just like accepted these parameters that are um, horrible, (laughs) you know. Yeah, Yeah, our consent consent for complacency has been has been manufactured and it's been manufactured. And that's the and that's the sad part. You know, it's like these things, wanting people to be able to meet their basic needs, you know, UBI, you know, national health care. Medicare for all. Yeah, Medicare for all, guaranteed housing. Like me personally, like I guess folks would think I'm much more radical. But just from what I've seen, you know, um, people's basic needs, should it, they should be provided for, like, hands down. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The other thing is, is that America genuinely, and I think I was talking about this at the beginning of the podcast, is that America needs to actually enforce its antitrust laws. 
You know, mm-hmm. if we're going to have to live, if we're going to have to continue to live under capitalism, which I would, I personally, I would not like to, but if we have to, <laughs> yeah, same here. ideally, yeah, like, like it, definitely it's, some things that, yeah, enforce that, start defanging these lobbying companies because, yeah. as Dr. Butch Ware says, whoever funds you runs you. And yep. we know yeah. that a lot, and we know that the party and a lot of these politicians are funded by a lot of interests that care more about enriching themselves versus mm-hmm. what's best for people you know yeah. we can't, you know we can't you know the, the same people who stand the same interests that stand in the way of gun legislation are the ones sending weapons over to bomb palestinians and the lebanese and yeah. folks in syria you know whoever if they're tied to iran now and, and, that's, you know, and yemen yeah. You know, yeah. the same people like and that's the thing. Another reason why folks need to realize how connected these things are. The same yeah. people who are building these cop cities have connections with Kamala based on, you know, her history as, you know, being a prosecutor and things like that. You know, mm-hmm. it really is like this, you know, weird nepotism slash networking system who, you know, are the people it is what gets you far in these spaces or well, cops yeah, get training from the or cops get training from the idf i mean like it's yeah. it's this kind of yeah, weird exactly. the, 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 relationship yeah, the, that's kind of messed yeah. up yeah, yeah the nypxd the the one of the biggest gangs in 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 the united states you know yeah. next, i guess next to the la and, and not, or chicago pd yeah they get training from the IDF, from the iof I I have to throw in, too, because just because I'm such a prison abolitionist, uh, I always have to throw those out, too. But, you know, that's another place where we are. um, (laughs) We are outsourcing uh, our our, our, uh, prison industrial complex. They write write billions of dollars of of slave labor are, are coming out of prisons. Yes, and there's uh, they're going to Walmart and they're going to, you know, uh, all these different uh, corporations that oh. are yeah, fine. The, no one's going to question it. Nobody gives a fuck. No. And, you know, yeah. And like, because it's, in always, the system. It's, always, it's always been that way since they passed the 13th Amendment, because slavery is abolished unless you, you know, punishment for a crime. Yeah. Crime. yeah. And they and, you know, they've always had jail gangs where they make them do hard labor and stuff like mm-hmm. that. So oh, yeah. it's just the continuance, but like t- just turned up to the 25th power. Because yeah. that's what you do with the Reserve Army of Labor, right? Yeah. Capitalism requires the reserve army of labor. So in order mm-hmm. to, keep, you know, they're basically turned into unpersons. It's a way of getting them out of the system. And yep. arguably, which is weird because America, America has very a lot of very serious problems that could be solved by, you know, good, honest labor. <laughs> you know, people are paid at a fair wage. I mean, that's the thing. The other thing that's really interesting is... Yeah, like the interesting thing, just on a pure pragmatic level, doing it the way that we do it is more expensive. We yeah. always talk all the time about how much money like this, like we, you know, we've saved or whatever. And it's like, if you really cared about saving money, you wouldn't do it this way. You know, a good example of that is, is, like, is, social, is social programs, right? One of the ways that you could just make them cheaper is by making them universal. So you don't have to have yeah. all this bureaucracy, right? The reason why Social Security is so successful and why it's almost impossible for politicians to get rid of it is because it's universal. You turn 65, boom, you get it. Medicare is mm-hmm. the same way. If you turn 65, boom, you get it. When they're universal like that, then they're very much harder to pull away. And that's, yeah. and that's that, so that means testing nonsense is crap. Oh, and, it's hard, and it costs more money to do it that way. Yeah. But they, because it's not, at the end of the day, it's not about money. It's about, yeah. it's about the crew. It's yeah, about, it's about it's, and it's it's about it's about political, it's about ideology, and it's about judgment and how you yes. think and what you think about the people who you are the, the people that you're supposed to serve and that you're supposed yeah. to represent. Like a private, I I don't think it was by a government, but I forget the city that I was in. They did a pilot program of giving folks uh, uh, for UBI. Mm-hmm. And they saw drug, and they saw like the best. Well, God, I'm sounding like Trump here. Like they saw <laughs> the best, the best results of what happens when you give when you just give people money. Believe me, 
So, yeah. You know, it's, it's, like, they've done the studies of, of you know, of, you know, the, the sources of, of, you know, what we call crime. When mm-hmm. someone cannot meet a basic need, they're going to do something so that they can try to meet it in whatever means possible. So we, we have the studies and we have the, the information. So, again, it comes back to this is all this is intentional because it's not in folks's ideological and material interests to to give a fuck. Well, capitalism is crimogenic. It creates mm. criminal classes. It creates yes. it, it creates, creates permanent underclass. Yeah. And the permanent underclass is not going to just necessarily sit around and be a permanent underclass, yeah. you know, like without doing anything for itself. You know, right. um, a lot of this, a lot of the talk you talk about poor people having um, drinking or poor people going out and doing this or doing that. If you've been poor, it fucking sucks. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Even the even the thought of the time when I was, you know, I was, you know, dismissed or, you know, I was, you know, basically thrown away from like the last job, office job that I had. And the year or two years that I had to deal with like not being able to find a job. And then mm-hmm. that was around the time when we had our, you know, supposed lockdown when COVID oh happened. yeah so that shit fucking it sucks and like it and if you have like and if you deal with mental mental health issues mm-hmm. it's compa- it just compounds it you yes. know so i laugh when people like say oh well money doesn't solve anything and i'm like well it doesn't solve everything but it solves a hell of a lot if you have a lot of it especially in a yeah. society where you where you need it, otherwise you will fucking starve. Like, you're not going to get with that. You know? If you're sitting there trying to budget your way around ramen noodles, it's money solved some things. Yeah. I have conversations, or at least one, a lot of conversations with one liberal I had who, like, I had to actually pull out of him that, like, he was against the UBI because it will create deadbeat dads. It's like, and it's like, why do I care? But, and uh, thankfully, this guy did not say so. So when like a friend of mine, Phoenix, Phoenix Rising, a friend of Chrissy and Steve and uh, Foxy as well, uh, lamented that one time that they could not get $30 for um, talk about it. So well, that night they gave them $30 today just for that reason. Since it's like International Lesbians Day, apparently. Who knows? Was, but this one liberal said to me, he's like, thankfully he did not say it in that chat, but he's like, come on, $30 for like a meal when you're poor or something like that? And I'm just like, are you seriously judging a poor person for how they spend their money? Yeah. Yeah. Which the people, it's the people that look in other people's shopping carts. Yes. You know, yeah. Like in line at the that, grocery store. Like, oh, oh, they're. And then, oh, you know, and then yeah. once they get up to the counter and see that they're like paying for. Paying oh, with an EBT oh, card. Like, yeah. Paying for yeah. with yeah. the EBT card. And it's like, bitch, as someone who has an EBT card, who mm-hmm. does who is lucky and fortunate enough that they can, that they, you know, that they need that assistance. Lobster is a food and it's yes. not prepared. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and, no, I, well, you know, and, and nobody, and, and nobody asked you. Like that's exactly. the thing about the people who are the people the people who are judgmental about how poor people spend whatever money they happen to have. Well, nobody asked you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's no, no, nobody. You, it's not for you to be consulted on what people spend their money on. Yeah, My go-to example yeah, no, about this oh, is rich people spend their rich people are smarter about what they spend. Yeah. Their money on. <laughs> like, no. Are you serious? Have, no? have, you, have you seen what a rich person spends their money on? I mean, yeah. Jeff Bezos it's spending genius. billions to put his dick rocket in space. I mean, yeah, I really yeah. Look, a, that was a penis rocket. Remember, people will never forget the penis rockets. There was a hot minute there where, like, people were really excited about whether or not he would come back down. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, please just the, stay. The one yeah. example, the one example I always give, and Corey's heard this, so sorry you have to hear it again. But I always go to one of um, uh, George Orwell's lesser-known books. It's a book called *The Road to Wigan Pier*. It's about coal miners in oh, yeah. in England, 
Mm-hmm. And there's a section of the book where he's sort of talking about what coal miners buy, right? Like at the end of their week, they get their pay, whatever. They're buying cigarettes, they're buying booze, they're buying candy, they're buying maybe foods that are bad for them. And, you know, the 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 upper class would often scoff at them and say, why would they waste their money on all this horrible stuff? And I'm like, look, coal mining is one of the hardest jobs on the planet. A lot of these people don't survive to be to see their grandkids, right? These people die of black lung, lung if they're lucky. If they're not so lucky, they, they die from horrific accidents. Um, and so they want a little relief from how hard work is on them. I'm never going to begrudge somebody for, you know, wanting to have a cigarette because they are having a hard life. Mm-hmm. Like for a lot of people in America, especially them having a smoke breaks, the only break they're going to get that day. Yeah. yeah. So while yeah. I personally don't smoke and I don't drink, like I'm not going to ever judge people about that, you know, so long as they don't you know, drive or hurt people. But like, you know, like when they're high, <laughs> but like, but I, but I feel very strongly about that, that, that Orwell's broader point is that, you know, th- that, you know, first off, as Steve said, Steve said, who the fuck are you to judge mm-hmm. me? Yeah. But second of all, is that sometimes you need that release from just how yes. hard living under capitalism is. Yeah. And I think we all do. And, and, and I think that's I think that's the challenge is, you know, it would be great to build a world. I mean, I genuinely believe if we built a more equitable, democratic world. You would have less substance abuse. You'd have less. Yeah. You, know, yep. you would have a lot less violence. You'd have a lot less crime. Like, there you would know, be resources to help people who, you know, who end up having yeah. issues that's- with you know, and that's another thing too. Like, you know, you live in a city where you see a lot of homeless people, and it's like, do you think it's because like they want to be? Even if they no. want to, be, who the fuck cares? Who yeah. the fuck asked you? And you know, like, we have the tools to be able to house everyone, but they choose not to do it because, yeah. again, it's not in their material or ideological interest to do so. Yeah. So this is not. It's not like. You know, it's a way of controlling are, it's not, people. It's not just the, mm-hmm. this is just the way it is. No, this is just the way that things have been made. Mm-hmm. And our consent has been, and our consent for complacency or resignation to that has been manufactured over the years. And yeah. so, you know, listen, yeah. There's you're, the you're cool in your resignation, then that's fine. The rest of us who understand that things are this way for a reason and that they're intentionally made this way, Mm-hmm. And that another way is possible somewhat. I, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go that other way. Yeah, yeah. Those I think. Oh, go cities, ahead. <laughs> sorry, those tent mm-hmm. cities, mm-hmm. those uh, and the roundups of people in the tent cities and the various things. Mm-hmm. Don't forget, part of that is a threat to yeah. people who have houses, who yes. are yes. housed, but precariously. Yeah, yeah, that's right. yeah. Where it, it, are you good yeah. Being? So get your shit together and work twenty hours a week, and don't get health care and shut yeah. the fuck up. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a way of it's a way of policing people because I think most people. I mean, I think in America, especially like you have a, a huge bunch of people are sort of temporarily embarrassed millionaires. Right. So they're like yeah. the people who think that maybe someday I'll be wealthy, too, which mm. is a farce, um, you know, because most people don't ever leave the class they're born into. And your zip code sure. is going to tell you a lot about your future than anything else. But it, I think the other thing, too, is that um, it's is that Americans need to recognize that they're a hell of a lot more closer to the people that they that they scorn who are in the tent cities than they are to Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos or Larry exactly. Ellison. Right? Like they're much closer to that. Most Americans are closer to that. Most Americans can't afford a four hundred dollar emergency. Most Americans live paycheck to paycheck. We've seen wages not keep up with productivity in the last four four to five decades. So mm-hmm. Americans are more productive than ever. Don't let anybody tell you that Americans are lazy because they're not. Americans exactly. are, are working harder than they ever have and they're getting less for it Mm -hmm. and so and and so i think it's it's really important for people to recognize that those are the challenges and and, and so it's i mean long and short of it is eat the rich i mean like these people (laughs) you know you know or the joke i always say you know the people it's like that what what were the the the, um the the uh what was his name the mike gravel campaign people in like 2020 they were like 
don't eat them because they taste like shit. Mm-hmm. But their but their buttons that they were selling out for the, his can his sort of gadfly campaign was compost the rich, which I thought was cool yes. too. But but I but I you know because <laughs> I'm actually useful because think about the challenges of our time, right? The reason mm-hmm. why a lot of people you know why the rich hold on to their wealth one it's generational. Yes. Um, most, you know, you yeah. know, I think it's most most people who are super wealthy who are under the age of 30 in America, most of the time they've inherited it. Right. Yeah. And that was the whole point of like estate taxes and breaking up monopolies is that we would not have dynasties in America. We would not have kings. That was the whole point. Right. We wouldn't, you, you know, we wouldn't have kings in terms of politics, but we shouldn't have kings in terms of economics. Yeah. You know, and now you have literal kings. So, and now we have like literal kings, right? And that's kind of the challenge, dynasty, right? We've had, we've had dynasty after dynasty, like you know the Rock of we, you know who yeah came Rockefellers and the, the Kennedys. Yeah, the Kennedys. I mean it's challenged that's that sort of dynastic notion. I always find a little icky that Americans are so obsessed with the royals. Like I find that so <laughs> weird. Like yeah, we're a country yeah. on telling the king to go fuck itself. Like I I really feel strongly like no one should care about these people. I you blame know, Disney. I blame Disney. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's a lot of it is, and people live in. I mean, I think the other challenge is, is that you know we've we have been deprived of a future. Yes, you know this is something. You know, Mark Fisher wrote about this too, and he's kind of basing a little bit of this on Beef of Baratti's work. But like the slow cancellation of the future it didn't happen all mm-hmm. at once. But the, but but basically, like that's part of the reason why, like it seems like. No movies are like new. They're all based on like existing things or the reboots or sequels or prequels or whatever, or that like, or the things, or it's like, or, you know, you know, it was like for in here in America, it was like Bush, then Clinton, then Bush, then Clinton ran. And then it's like, it's the same people going back and back and forth. People have this sense of nostalgia about the Obama campaign now in reference to Kamala Harris to kind of bring it full circle. But nostalgia is fundamentally conservative. That's yeah. I mean, it yeah. is. And, yeah. and so it, because it, it, it negates our capacity for thinking of what the future might be. And mm-hmm. so that's what is important for us on the left, regardless of what stripe you are, is to conceive of what a possible future is like, mm-hmm. because we can't let go of that component because there are days where I'm cynical. And I just think most of the people around me are total bastards and everything's going to suck forever. Yeah. But then I think about things that have changed just even in my lifetime that have been for the better. And I'm only 34 years old. There's certain things that have gotten better that we have in some, in some respects become a more tolerant society. In some ways we, in some respects, we've become a more accepting society than we used to be. And what we see are these terrible, you know, uh, uh, backlashes to that, right? I think the success of people like Trump and, and, and others is because America is changing. I mean, people, yes. I mean, people need to recognize that the single largest religious demographic in the United States now is none. Yes, it's none. N-O-N-E-S. It's the nuns. Now, they're not necessarily explicitly atheists, nope. but a lot of them are, including myself. Mm-hmm. But like there are people who are unreligious. Yeah. And I think that and, and the fact that they're larger than these evangelical psychos who want to institute Christian nationalism in this country. Mm-hmm. Project Project you know, 2025 and just like all of this. Right. Like. That's a good reason to vote against Trump is to vote against Christian nationalism because these people will get back into power. And that scares the hell out of me on that. Yeah, I I definitely agree. And and like I I agree in some aspects, but I also I guess to go back to what I was had said before that, like, especially for those of us who if we're in a position to to be to want to be forward thinking and want, and especially if, if, you know, if you're going to participate in electoral politics and you want something more than the, than the duopoly that, you know, that has a stranglehold on us, then I do think it's, it's that the onus, that the responsibility is on folks to take that chance to, to vote for, for something different. And again, if it doesn't work, then it doesn't work. But I think, uh, I think folks get, get, you know, sort of discombobulated, especially with, I think, I think when Roe v. Wade got overturned, it really discombobulated folks because the whole nature, the the path of thinking was, is that, yeah, things are bad, but then we, you know, but then folks fought for them um, and the right things got made into law and it, 
is settled or it should just be settled. And I think that, if anything, show people that these advances that we've made, nothing is settled in stone because, you know, in a type of society that we're in, you know, created, you know, the, you know, the fulcrum is, you know, it's white supremacy, it's genocide, it's settler colonialism. It's all of these things that are the opposite of what we want. And the opposition, the opposition, yeah, and the opposition has let us know for years that they're going to, that they're in it for power to turn the clock back. And nothing is ever given, you know what I'm saying? Like, just how you said about um, the Great Society and the New Deal, how FDR didn't give, didn't, you know, enact all these things out of the goodness of his heart and, or because that he wanted to or anything like that. No, it's because people were striking. People were resisting. People were fighting. They, you know, they, power, they rushed like, revolution. Power, with they concede nothing without... They concede nothing without force because yeah. force is all they know. Force is how we got this nation, you know, and force is how a lot of nations came into existence. And that's the only that's oh, the true, only true. language that they understand. That's the only language that they respond to. You know, same thing with how with certain boycotts, like, you know, uh, folks just didn't take, you know, the bus back in the day or true. even now with folks, people people understanding with what little power that they have and where they send their money to not, well, maybe I'm not going to, you know, go to Starbucks anymore. Or maybe I'm not going to buy, not, maybe I'm not going to consume these products anymore. Sometimes you have to, you have to confront power via the language, via via the languages that they understand and that they, that they respond to, you know, so going back to, to rights and, and, you know, like I said, power doesn't really concede anything without force. So, you know, it's up to us. It's going to take courage. And I'm not saying that I'm, you know, out here in the streets like that. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. uh, you know, I work, you know, I do I do three 12 yeah. hour days and I have limited bandwidth because, you know, I'm a high functioning depressive. So, mm. you know, there's only so many things that I'm, you know, rah, rah about. But if I could inspire anybody to, you know, maybe have the gumption. If you can't, if it's in, if it's, if it's in your ministry to, to, to fight that part of the fight, then I think it's, it's, you know, it's on us to, to do it, to push for it. For me, it's kind of like, um, as I'm more interested in like after the election of like yeah, what right. I was going to do, yeah. because mm-hmm. like, I, I uh, yeah, like kind of like I'm constantly optimistic, but there's always a chance you can't just don't like hedge your bets. It's like, oh, it's for sure going to be like this person. And then the election then results are, oh, God, I was not mentally prepared for this. So that's why I'm kind of not like so certain that's going to be Kamala Harris. Constantly vigilance, is, vigilance is required. Yes. Yeah. In this All system. of this. So, but it's like, I wish I could like do more mutual aid uh, organization, more like helping them uh, yeah. doing the research and that sort of thing, getting to know my local community so that oh, like, yeah. it, it's I can. Definitely, it's definitely a rewarding experience. You get to know the people around you, you get to know the concerns of folks mm-hmm. in, in other places and other boroughs. You know, mm-hmm. I've, I was, I've been fortunate to have done some mutual aid with mm-hmm. some folks out in, um, out in Queens and Brooklyn and, you know, understanding, you know, uh, giving folks what they need, food, meals, um, yeah. for folks who are, you know, unhoused, um, oh, yeah. uh, basic, basic necessities, toiletries, especially mm-hmm. for folks who have a uterus and they need, you know, menstrual products. And oh, yeah, yeah. Like that. So you really become in tune to what folks need on the ground level um, via mutual aid. So I, right. that's something yeah. that's definitely needed. We need, we definitely need more of that. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I just personally, then I, I kind of like decided that like what I'm gonna actually do, or I wanted like do this first, make sure my friends are taking care of Joanna Phoenix, uh, Joy Firelander, and that's not going Lyndon Quinn. So that's why I personally decided work as many hours as I can. That's where too, which is why I'm gonna do eleven more hours the rest of this week since I like skip work uh, for the afternoon to like join this like um a stream, uh and but like it's. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just gonna like 
I've been, I wish that like just voting for the Democrats and writing to my representatives would be like, could you please input, uh, institute like UBI and stuff like that? Okay, sure, we'll do that right now. UBI, like, here we go, done. And it's just like, but no, I bet even if they, they will either say, oh, this is not popular or we don't have the political will or maybe is that. Maybe they'll say, oh, no, I will vote for it. But then uh, hours later, it's like, well, I didn't vote for it because of unforeseen consequences. Oh, so, or, or they pull the Hulk Hogan. Oh, that's, that's not going to work for me, brother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I think for me, it's like, I, I, you know, I did art activism for a number of years. You know, I was, I was, uh, mm-hmm. I did secular activism and that's how Corey and I met years ago. And oh, so cool. I did some of that. And then I was involved in, you know, I was involved in, the, uh, I was involved in the first Obama campaign in high school. I worked on that. I was involved in both of Bernie's campaigns, and then I joined DSA, and then I left DSA, and then I was in PSL for a time, um, and then I just sort of left. Um, I, I'm not particularly good at being an activist, so uh, yeah, I don't have to before. Hey, you tried though. You know, I did it off and on for years, and so primarily for me, my hope is is to my role is to be an educator. That's part of the reason mm-hmm. I do the show with Corey. It's part of the reason why I love being a public historian and and the job that I have, where I can help people, you know, learn more about history, um, especially history of their communities, history of my of my great state of Indiana, where I'm from, and you know, and and also to to do the kind of work that fascinates me about the, the, the sort of the, the, the variety and the vibrancy of, of thought that exists on the political left. Um, and, you know, primarily I'm a Marxist, but I, you know, but I'm influenced by a lot of different things. And, and so for me, being an educator is, is the way that I have found myself, um, I think giving hopefully my best contribution. Um, mm-hmm. And, and so that, that's what inspires me is, is that people can maybe learn something from me and then inspires them to, to do other things that that maybe I can't. Um, and, it's, you know. and it's most needed too, especially like f- folks call this age like we're post truth. I it's an age of not just misinformation but disinformation because yeah. keeping intentionally keeping people intentionally lying to people, you know, it it serves a purpose. You know, it keeps them uninformed. It keeps them voting against their political and material best mm-hmm. interests. So, educating folks is it's a it's a huge responsibility. But it seems like seems like for you, it's it's pretty rewarding, which you know is good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's the best for me. That's the best way I've figured out how to do what I do, and and that's why I love doing it. <laughs> so. We are approaching the two hour mark. And this has been a great conversation, as it were, too. But like, <laughs> and I could probably go on for like a few more hours, but I also don't think I want to like keep anyone from any other obligations. Or I think my anything. kids are going to bed, so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I have to run and get something to eat. Yeah. yeah so let's quick, quickly go around the room. Any final thoughts or like plans for after? Any final thoughts? Let's, let's just not to like and go, drag it on for too long. Uh, hold out till the election's over and then take a nap. I think that's my long-term plan there between you know. now and yeah. November. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Just for the next four weeks. <laughs> you know, I, I have a feeling that it's going to be a tight election. It might be even be a little messy. Yeah. So we may not know yeah. for a few days. So just, um, you know, take care of yourself, take care of others, you know, you know, be good to people as best you can. And, and, We'll deal with whatever the consequences of that election are, um, and and hopefully it's a better one. I mean, than others, but you know, it's. But my hope in general is that, um, you know, because I'm very, my position is very similar to Angela Davis's, which is that if Harris wins, it may potentially give us the space to do more than it would than we would under Trump. We, that could be totally yeah. wrong. Yeah. But that's my opinion on that. And I could be completely wrong on that. And I and I completely support people who who are going to vote for, um, you know, uh, the PSL ticket or vote green. Like, I respect that. I think that's totally fine. Um, I'm never, ever going to vote shame anybody. Um, I think that in a vibrant democracy, there should be multiple parties and people should have to have that rigorous debate instead of shaming. So, um, so yeah, I think, you know, vote your conscience, vote what works for you, um, and then just take care of yourself and others. Uh, yeah, the, they do what you, you want, uh, uh, 
yeah, I would like the people to do as much, much like a uh, mutual aid as they can, or like more direct action as were well too. Or even if like all you're comfortable is doing is that after the election, remember after the election, if you are that kind of person that like likes to write to like call your representative, yeah, please do so. Even on the things that you already agree with them done, they would like to know that like, okay, good, I am supportive of this one, and like that's what my constituent wants as well too. And but, like for me as an anarchist who's like, it's very simple call about the representative democracy in a lot of ways. Uh, practice mutual aid, but take care of yourselves, take care of others. Uh, join the local IWW. Try to reunionize your workplace, as we've mentioned about unions, and the strength of them when they are strong. Uh, be important and do direct action as well. Um, Chrissy? Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um... <laughs> uh, my thinking in this election, and I live in a blue state where my vote doesn't matter, and there are a lot of structural reasons why. Um, so I would say in the future, uh, if you see something about ranked vote, you know, ranked choice voting, yeah. if you see something about um, just changing up the the, uh, the electoral situation because there are structural reasons we have we keep getting stuck with two mm -hmm. uh, people yeah. and it's not necessarily just because there's not the will for a third party it's because uh power has decided you know has structured itself in such a way to keep us from having more than that uh so i would say you know look at the state of our democracy and how it is structured and uh, think about ways that, that that could be changed. Those are big things. Um, in the short term, when it comes to Harris, I, I follow a lot of uh, Palestinians on social media, those who still have access to it. I know that they are very worried about the possibility of a Trump presidency. I think they have very good reasons to be very worried about that. Um, it is uh, the... And for them, of course, it is the difference between hell on earth and even worse hell on earth. Mm -hmm. But when you're living in hell on earth, I suppose that that is uh, an important distinction or something that they seem uh, that they are putting out there. I, I guess I always feel a responsibility to vote because America is so ubiquitous. It has so much of a military presence in the world. It has so much of a political presence in the world. And there are many, many people, people all over the global South, people all over the world who would love to have a vote in the American mm -hmm. elections. Yes. Yeah. Even if it was just a performative one. Uh, so I feel a certain responsibility to exercise my vote, however useless it may be in the best way I can, but it's up to everybody. It's I don't tell anybody who to vote for, who not to vote for, except don't vote fucking Republican assholes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the big qualifier I should have said earlier. Too. <laughs> you know, I'll just say that, but you know, you don't have to listen to me, obviously. <laughs> but yeah, that's my point. That's, I guess, everything. Uh, tag. <laughs> Steve, you go next. I already went. I just yeah. said I'm taking a nap. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's right. So... It doesn't have Foxy. Foxy, Foxy, yeah, your final thoughts. Final thoughts? Um, my final thoughts. I would hmm, I would say to the folks who live in the states that do matter, who have the choice uh, if they are able to forge for something different, I would I would suggest courage in taking that step because I do follow, I also follow a lot of Palestinians and some Lebanese folks on Twitter and I do follow the um, abandoned Harris movement closely which is full you know which has a share of of um, Palestinians and and Leban and Lebanese folks and given how given how that demographic in one such battleground state in Michigan, seeing how it's, as it's not going well 
for the Democrats, given, you know, their stance on Palestine. Um, I think we're in a unique position to finally, you know, for those who who continue who are going to continue to partake in electoral politics, like this is the chance now to to forge for for the change that that we all want, that we all that we all need, you know what I mean? Because especially in in regards to third parties, like there should be nothing stopping them from coming into existence. Only, you know, both, you know, the two parties that we do have do all they can to keep them from coming into power. You know, um, like the PSL candidates, they were fighting a lawsuit from the Democrats in Georgia trying to keep them off the ballot. The Green yeah. Party has also had to deal with um, with them with Democrats trying to kick them off the ballot in certain states, you know, and they're the ones who've done the most work to be able to get on the ballot in pretty much all, almost all 50 states. So I would say, um, I'm not necessarily trying to like shame anyone into voting in any personal way. I am also not the type to, to sugarcoat what our vote means. So I would just say to folks, like, if you're going to vote a certain way, if you're going to vote for a certain party, regardless of of which party it is, to just understand what it says, what it means, and stand on business on it. And, you know, don't, I guess, don't, you know, try to be, don't, don't do performative victimhood when people hold you to a choice that you've made. Hmm. All right, Corey, the one Canadian in this like panel. (laughs) What's your opinion on the American election or at least final thoughts? Uh, I guess, yeah, I kind of been quiet the whole time. I've just been trying to listen. I I appreciate all the thoughtful like perspectives everybody seems to have. Everybody's clearly thought these ideas through very well as, Mm -hmm. you know, as well as one can. I appreciate that a lot. And I guess as for myself, like I have zero faith in the electoral system or in states in general. So, (laughs) so as far as like who wins, I think Trump would be better than Kamala or worse than Kamala. Right. (laughs) So, so I guess if, if that's a thing, you, you vote with your values. If you think that Kamala matches your values, then vote. Um, But Don't ever stop doing like grassroots organizing. Don't ever stop doing mutual aid. Uh, It's unfortunate that the election takes as much wind out of everybody's sails as it does. Yeah. Because so much still needs to be done, even though there's an election on the, (laughs) on the horizon. Right. So, so I guess I, I I really hope that, you know, the best thing, the best thing that can happen happens. And, and, uh, yeah, Trump definitely doesn't get in. That's kind of mm-hmm. the the main idea. Mm-hmm. Um, and if if he does, like, yeah, come move up here. Come. On. <laughs> <laughs> Are you I, lonely? Is that why you're say, uh, offering I, us to come I, to Canada? I, w- I want you all to be safe. This is my concern. <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't have me. <laughs> <laughs> I've been up there before. It's nice. But at the same time, I think uh, I will. I'm in. I'm in New York. I'll, yeah. I'll be. I'll. I'll be okay. You'll be in one of the regions that separates from the United States. <laughs> I'm in Pacific Northwest, so free for Canada. All right. Uh, All right. Uh, yep. Thank, thank you, everybody, everybody for, for Hi, joining thanks, us. Thanks, everyone. Mm-hmm. Thank you thank so you much. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Christy, Steve. It's great yeah. so much. Yeah. Thanks yeah. to everybody for listening and watching. And uh, thank you for your comments in the stream. I'm, we didn't get to them, but mm-hmm. we, we, <laughs> I appreciate them. All right. See you later. Mm-hmm. Thanks, y'all. Yep. Bye-bye. All right, folks. That's all for now. Thanks for watching or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends or on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it, and it helps me keep the power on. 
Thanks to my top patrons, Damian Marie Athope, uh, Some Random Geek, Justin Clark, Dan F. Smith, and Lisa Glass. And thank you to my new patrons. You can stay tuned for the list of patrons at the end to see your name listed. If you aren't a patron and want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can send a one-time donation to buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. I also have a Substack where you can subscribe for free or you can donate per month. And lastly, you can get a paid subscription on Spotify that will give you the same access to bonus content and extra long episodes. If you can't contribute financially, then I would like on YouTube or a five-star rating on a, and a review on Apple Podcasts or one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser would be great. If you want to find more from me, then make sure to check out the show notes for links to all my stuff or check out my link tree. That's linktr.ee slash skeptical leftist. That's where you can find all of my social media spaces and communities. You can also email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening or watching. Make sure to leave a comment on the video, join your local org, print off some posters or pamphlets, and spread the propaganda. Also, stick around for a clip from this episode's post-show chat. want for all of those things um worth displacing another people from their land yeah. from their home and, yes. the answer, and the answer is that's no right. no that's it's right it's not you know yeah, yeah. so i just think right. folks try to trip us up you know when folks try to trip you're like oh well what is it why are you against jews having a safe place where they can be safe away Christ. from it at these yeah. stuff like that well number one fuck you for that number two <laughs> I'm not against that. The problem is your want for safety does not mean you get to dismiss the humanity mm -hmm. of these That's other right. of these people.